And so today when I stand here, I think of the mercy of God for my life and I'm overwhelmed. How about you? I'm overwhelmed. And yet I also know that Lord, use us to let your mercy touch other people because we need Jesus today. Amen. And so Father, I thank you for this moment and we give you all the praise and the glory for who you are. Where would we be without the mercy of God? Thank you so much for what you have done in our lives. We ask today also for your grace and mercy, not only for our church and for our city, but for our nation. Let your grace and just uh, your mercy and your peace touch every family in Texas and in Buffalo and California. Lord, I thank you for just the mercy of God right now in Jesus' name. Lord, in Desta's family today, we thank you for the grace of God, the mercy of God. And Lord, we ask for just a wave of your Holy Spirit to touch our, our nation and the nations of the world. And Lord, in our lifetime, that we would say yes to you and that you would be able to use us for your glory because we say yes to you. And we say, uh, we say, Lord, have your way in this place and in our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. You know, if you remain standing just for just one more moment here. I want to just take time to honor a Memorial Day weekend uh, every person, every man, every woman who's lost their life serving our country. I think it's important that we re uh, honor them. And for uh, many families, this weekend is very hard and it's, it's uh, maybe even devastating. And I want to take time to honor a young man that I was a friend uh, to. We played basketball together uh, here at the park and at the Hyper in different places. Brent Hershey. I was in the ROTC program here at IU. Great man of God, loved God. He and I did Bible studies together. After college, he got engaged. He went and fought in Afghanistan and lost his life serving our country. Never got a chance to be married or have a child. And I honor him today, I honor his family today, and I honor every person who gave everything for our nation. Even though it's imperfect, I'm thankful for the freedoms and the opportunity that we have here in our great nation. Let's please give them a hand if you don't mind. We honor each of them today. Amen. Amen. You may be seated today. Great to have you here. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing both in person and online. And if you are new to City, we ask you to please make three visits we think it takes a little bit of time to get to know us, and we would love the chance to get to know you here at City as we love, as we build, and as we lead. Um, I want to give a shout out today. This is so cool. Uh, we are doing uh, live translation in uh, the service uh, uh, for Spanish, and, uh, and because we believe it's important that all of us are together. And what's really cool is, is right now there's a lady here who speaks Portuguese only. And so right now there is a guy in Spain who is clicked in and he's interpreting for her right now in the room. Come on, let's make it up. Let's give it up. Isn't that amazing? We can do better than that. We're City Church for all nations. So we welcome you in Spain, welcome you in this room. And uh, I love that. Um, I want to just encourage you before I begin preaching here that this Wednesday is what we call Revival Nights. Uh, it used to be called First Wednesday. We just wanted to change it to Revival Nights because we think revival's happening. Uh, as we have a water baptism, as extended worship, I'll be preaching. Uh, we have personal ministry that happens on those Wednesday services. And so this Wednesday, June 1st, Revival Night, all baptisms as weather permits will be outside. We'll do a worship set outside. We'll have an after party outside. So if you wanna get water baptized, sign up. It's gonna be great. Bring your family, bring your friends. It's a great way to start the summer, right, on Revival Night. I love it. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to preach today a message to uh, conclude the series of this month entitled Vision. We've spoken about our church's vision, but we've tied that in to the vision for your life because God has something specifically for you. No one is an accident. We believe that everyone has a purpose from God, and I want to expound on that thought today. I want to read a passage of scripture out of Psalms 139 that talks about God really being involved uh, in our lives when we were in our mother's womb and how he fashioned our days. And so I want to preach a message entitled, Reach Up and Look Up. Everyone say, reach up, look up. And I'll explain why, because most of the time when we have our hands lifted. Now, we can do this and have our heads down. Absolutely, I know that. But most of the time, have you noticed that when our arms go up, our head goes up? 
It's a natural progression. And I want to speak to you today about reaching up to God for our identity and our purpose and what God has for us. And then I want to talk about looking up to God for the purpose of our life because he thinks about us more than the sand on the seashore. And then I want to talk about how you and I can really connect to that in a practical way by letting God touch our heart. So if you have your Bible, Psalms 139, the Bible says this, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. You can turn to your spouse and say, amen. Your, it was kind of a joke, no one laughed at that one. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, notice this, you saw me before I was born. And notice this, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Isn't that powerful? This prop up here today, we have the breakfast of champions. Come on, cinnamon toast crunch. This will make you a winner, Olympic champion right here. I'm telling you that right now. But this piece of metal is a spoon. It's a wonderful invention. Aren't you glad for silverware we can eat food with? Some of us don't use silverware enough. Amen. We won't talk about that. But this is just a piece of metal. And really, it has no pur its purpose isn't realized, I should say, until it is used by one of us. Other than that, it sits in the drawer on a counter. We know what its definition is, but until it is used by us, then its purpose is fulfilled. Other than that, really, it's just sitting there. This bowl, same thing. We know what it is, but until I use the bowl, then the purpose is realized or fulfilled. Really, our purpose in life is realized when we understand that it's connected to the means of something else. In other words, we're not an island to ourselves. The purpose of our life is linked to a greater cause. So today, you and I are similar to the spoon in a way with God. We're not a piece of metal. We're human flesh. We're a living spirit. But God has given us life and we see here in our verses, he was a part of the birth process for us to be here. And really, I would say, until we give our lives to God and let God hold us, if you will, and do what he wants to do, you and I will, I would say, maybe not realize the full purpose that God has. But when you and I are in the hand of God, he can do things that you and I could never dream of doing. How many believe that God can do anything when we give him our lives? When we are, how about this for a biblical passage? When we are a willing spoon, God can do great miracles. I want you to see here in the verses that I, re I read in my first thought of reach up, you and I can get our identity from a lot of different sources. We can get our a perspective, how we view ourselves, because messages are coming at us every day, and you and I have to determine who is going to, di who is going to dictate how I see myself. Where am I going to get who I am from? Because all of us are going to get that from something or somewhere. And when you and I look to God and we choose that God is that definite, he is that defining person in our life, that's when things come together. And I want you to see this. I'm going to reach up for my identity because God's the one that created me. I didn't, you know, I'm just bold about this. We came from God, not from an animal. And he created Adam and Eve. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He created the, uh, I would say, the multiplication of life. He made man and, and woman. They got together. We love that process. Can someone say Amen. Amen. And then uh, the holy, and then he causes women to conceive. And in their womb, we see here 
that God created the birth process. In fact, if you struggle with believing in miracles, just look up the fascinating process of a baby growing in a mother's body. God creates and causes that process to happen. And in the womb, we see here, he's making the delicate parts of our body. He is, he's really knitting us together, the Bible says. His workmanship is marvelous so, so that our, our bodies, our lives are a reflection of God's artwork. And he watches over us, or he started watching over us even when we were in our mother's womb. Now today I wanna stop here and say, I know right now as I am into this message, maybe for some mothers today and fathers, uh, this is a sore spot. Maybe you lost a child um, for whatever reason. And I want you to know that God sees you. And that baby is in heaven with Jesus. And you're gonna be with that child when you go to heaven. No child is lost. I wanna encourage you today. And that may not you know, soothe uh, the pain of losing a child in whatever way that would be, but we can grieve as those that have hope because in Christ, we live with him forever. And so I just wanna encourage all the mothers today that uh, this may be a, a sting right now, but God is with you and God sees you and God's with your baby and your baby's with God. And in the process of being in our mother's womb, God has watched over us. And so I know this may be basic, but it's really profound. This whole passage, this is a Psalm of David. This whole passage is profound because really God was a part of us getting here and while we were in our mother's womb, he was forming the parts of our body. He was shaping how we would look and who we would be. And then he watched over us in the entirety of that process. And then as we were born, he has angels that watch over us every day at Psalms 91. God is with us day to day in our lives. And this is important because if we're honest, many of us degrade ourselves. We think less of ourselves. We are mad at maybe something about our bodies. We're upset about something that we don't have or, um, or that we possess in the definition of someone else. But today, I have good news. Everyone in here and online, you are here on purpose. God puts you together and you reflect the glory of God in your skin tone, in your hair texture, male, female. God has fashioned you to be here. God made me bald so I could have summer. I love that. And maybe some of us don't like you know, different parts about us, but maybe some of our insecurities is a blessing from God to lead us into more of who he is for our lives. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize that, but literally she prayed if I'd be with a white man, he would need to be bald. Thank you, Jesus. I have summertime all the time. You and I have to reject, please hear me, you and I, this is one reason why you and I have to reject rejection. We must be combative against feelings and thoughts, images and words that would demean us to make us feel that we're nothing, that we don't measure up physically. We don't measure up because of skin tone. We don't measure up because of education. We don't measure because of whatever. We have to resist all that because while Systems play out. Family trees are what they are. When you and I come to Jesus, we're coming into God who made us in the first place. And when you and I come into Christ, you and I can have what God wants us to have, his purpose in our life. Think about this. God is involved in every child in the womb. Every child in the womb is being watched over by God. And God is fashioning them. He's He's weaving them together. He's doing something for their life already before they even take their first breath. And that applies to you and me. We're not here by accident today. And you and I have a purpose from God. I'm, I'm, I'm here to just encourage you to believe that you and I are here on purpose today and we are here because God has brought us here for such a time as this. And I know we've made mistakes and I know life's not perfect, and I know there's ups and downs, and I know there's guilt and shame, but Jesus is greater than all of that, and you are someone to Jesus, and God has something for your life. Come on, give him a better praise than that. 
This is true. This is Bible. And so we acknowledge the process of life that God created when he made Adam and Eve. We acknowledge the process of a child being developed in a womb and how sacred and powerful that is. And we also understand that we connect it to us that God has called you and I to be here in this time on purpose. We could have been anywhere in the history chain, but I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm here right now with air conditioning. I'm glad I'm here right now with ESPN. I'm glad I'm here right now with iPhones. I don't, I'm not ashamed about it. Thank you, Jesus. But we're here because God has called us to be here. We are today to reach up to God for our identity. We're to reach up. We can reach to social media. We can reach to culture. We can reach to our nation only. We can reach to this or that. Some of those things are not bad. Some of them are. But really, ultimately, we have to reach up to God and say, Lord, who am I? Why am I here? And then I acknowledge, I reach up, you made me. You caused the whole process of life to happen and you caused me to come alive by your will and I was in my mom's womb and you were working on my life even then. I reach up my identity today. I need you, God, show me who I am. Because you and I can say that I'm my own man and no one's defining who I am, but that's not true. Other things, other forces, other people are shaping how we see ourselves all the time. It doesn't matter who we are, how confident or unconfident we are. This is what's happening. And so I have to reach up and get that from God. God, you define who I am. Other people may say this, but what does God say about me? And when I get what God says about me, I am who God says I am. And I can be who God says I can be. This is, I'm preaching right to your soul today. And I know we have thoughts against ourselves. We have images against ourselves that are wrong. And I'm telling you, God says you're his work of art. And he was with you in your mother's womb. Reach up today for your identity. Reach up today for your purpose. Reach up to God and say, God, who am I and why am I here? And you may have a thriving career or no career or you're trying to find one or you're retiring. It really doesn't matter. No matter what we do for our occupation or career, God can use your life and give you purpose beyond making money, give you purpose beyond you know, living your dream and give you purpose beyond having vacations. All that's wonderful. But you and I can have a purpose that fulfills the soul and satisfies who we are and and you and I can make a difference both right now and for eternity through Jesus. So I reach up to God because notice he formed the parts of my body. He, his workmanship is wonderful. He made us all wonderfully complex. We know that's right. And he watched over us in the womb. And then we see in the other verses, this is why I said we reach up for our our identity, and then we look up to God. What's your plan for my life? Again, we can look at others, and some of this is not wrong, but just stay with me. Just lean in, please. Uh, we can look at others. We can look at trends. We can look at different things around us. We can you know, look at the past of our family. We can look at Hollywood. We can look at whatever and say, well, that's what I want to do. And again, some of that's not wrong. What I'm saying is we have to reach up to get our identity because he formed us. And then we really have to look up to God to get direction because notice what the Bible says. This is powerful. I want you to see this 16 and 17 one more time. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. That means that God thinks about you and I. His thoughts about us can't be counted, but he uses a beach to give an analogy of how many thoughts God thinks toward you and me. But what's profound is, and this is why, I, you know, uh, we must look up to God. We reach up and then we look up to God for direction because the scripture says in verse 16, when we were in our mother's womb, he was already laying out the path he had for our lives. Now, I want you to please stay with me on this point. That doesn't mean 
that the path of God for our life will automatically happen. We don't say, well, if God wants to do it, he's gonna do it, and I'm just gonna do whatever I want, and it will all play out the way he wants it. Kinda, sorta. He laid a path for us, but the Bible says that in Deuteronomy 30, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. I pray you choose life. Every day, he gave man the power to choose between life and death, blessing and cursing. We have to choose God, folks. That's why I have to reach up for identity because he made me. I'm from God. And then I have to look up to God for, Lord, uh, what's your direction for my life? Because he has a plan for my life, but I just can't sit back and do nothing. I have to take steps toward it and trust that his plan is the best. But when I do, he will reveal it. But I have to choose life. I have to choose blessing. Well, if God's plan is for everybody, why don't more people have the plan? I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you asked that question because the Bible says that we're up against an enemy and his job is to kill, steal, and destroy. He is attacking men and women all over the world. He hates us because we reflect the nature of God. And when you and I receive Jesus, he's fighting against the plan of God for our lives. Someone said, I don't believe in God. Look around and see all the evil happening and you know there's a devil. And if the devil is real, you know God is real. And the reason why... People's lives don't pan out with the path of God for them. There's multiple reasons, but one is because they're being bombarded by the forces of darkness. And this is why Paul said in Ephesians, we're not fighting against each other. We're fighting against a higher enemy that's making us think we're fighting against each other, and he wants to kill anyone he can. This is even what happened this past week with a young man in our church named Desta. Uh, I remember him coming, rough background situations there, and uh, coming to our church, going to CYC in the summer, a few summers, he went, he went with us, more than one, and, and it was a youth conference we had. I'll never forget, on one of the most powerful nights of the whole week, him in the balcony, I can see him still in my mind, in the balcony, just at the edge of the balcony, on his knees, hands raised, head back, receiving from God, trying his best to serve Jesus. Got water baptized in our church in youth group, trying to do it, up against a lot of hurdles, up against a lot of things, absolutely. And he chose to live a life that was dangerous and live a life that was on the edge. And this past week, that caught up with him. And two men killed him on the east side of Bloomington. Now, do you tell me that God thought about Desta in his mother's womb to be murdered at the age of 20? You can't justify that from Scripture. That's not a right teaching. That's an improper use of the sovereignty of God. You and I have a choice to make, and you and I can choose life. That doesn't mean that God didn't like Desta or love Desta or reach for him. I'm saying the devil wants to take people out, and this is why you and I have to say yes to God. I choose God. I serve God. I love God. Lord, I look up to God. Lord, what do you want me to do? You fashioned a path for me, and when I understand that, I have to yield to God and say, your way is better than my way. Your thoughts are better than my thoughts. I give to you my heart and my soul and my mind. I yield to you. What do you want from me? I reach up and I look up. Your way is better than mine. Now, Someone would say, okay, well, well, what happened at the camp? What happened at the conference? What happened when he was baptized? What happened with someone like Desta? Does that mean that wasn't real? Well, that's not right either. No, it was real. Someone received Jesus. Let Jesus come in their heart and save them. It's his spirit saved. When you receive Jesus, your spirit, you are spirit, soul, and body. Can I teach just a minute? Okay? Spirit, soul, and body. When you receive Jesus... Your, our spirit is born again. Our spirit will live forever when we pass away, with Christ or without him, somewhere. Eternity is real. So when I'm saved, when I receive Christ, my spirit is born again. But how many know my head is not? <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. And our soul, mind, will, and emotions all are, are, are all over the place. But that doesn't mean the ups and downs of my mind and my soul doesn't change that my spirit has been touched by Jesus. 
City church is never gonna sit here and judge someone and say, well, that happened to this person, that happened to that person. If they really got the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't do that. That's not your job. That's not my job. But we have to understand that God's plan for us before we got here, and what I wanna drive home to you today is his plan is good and not of evil to give you hope and expect it in. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. I've heard teaching from leaders that God is in control and that was God's will. I'm gonna tell you something. God is not involved in a young person being murdered. That's the devil. But God can redeem it and cause good to come from it. God is ready to open doors and make a way for you and me. We're just trying to rationalize the pain that we've navigated. And I understand it. Listen, I have a lot of pain. Now he's the 25th person that I've seen die. I've, I've seen a lot of death. I understand it. But I don't, I don't use my pain to have a wrong teaching from the scripture. God is the good guy and the devil's the bad guy. And he thinks about me more than the sands on the seashore. And there's not one thought in, in the mind of God of evil, of strife, of death or hurt. He has redemption. He has healing. He has peace. He has righteousness. He has joy. He has power in the Holy Spirit. He has purpose. And yes, we do have trouble. And yes, we do have ups and downs. And we do have temptation. Absolutely. And we have all the issues of life, but he's there. He is a brother. He is a God. He is a friend. He's a strong tower. And he's with us in the good and the bad. And he's not causing trouble. He's there to get me out of trouble. He's not causing death. He's there to redeem me from death. And when you and I have the plan of God, I don't, I don't care what the devil says. You're going to make it. You're going to do it because you and I have more power than the devil. We got Jesus. Come on, give God a big praise. I feel it in my soul. Hallelujah. He planned our days. He has a path for you and me. And I would ask you and I today to yield to that and say, Lord, your path and plan is mine. I receive it. I reach up for identity. You wove me. You framed me. You made me in my mother's womb. You caused me to come to life. And I look up to God for direction. What's my purpose in me being a banker? What's the purpose in me going to school? What's the purpose in me being a businessman and a construction worker? What's the purpose in my life? Because your occupation is a blessing, but what's the purpose of God in your life right now? You are more than what you do because you are who you have, and that is Jesus. Our identity is coming from him. This is why it's so important that you and I yield to God because, for, you know, the reality is people without God can have success. That's true. People without God can have their dreams as they know it come to pass, but never have full fulfillment in their life. Only God can give fulfillment. This is why we're, you know, as a, as a people, we reach out and do the same things every generation. And the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. So we have people that worship money, worship attention, worship sex, worship success, worship themselves, worship whatever, get caught up in other things that would take them away from God being number one. And many of those things aren't wrong, but they have to be, I use the word channeled, focused rather, channeled focused through Christ. Without God, we're just like a spoon. Made for something. But until in the hand of God, not finding what it is. I want to encourage all of us today that you and I are more than a piece of metal. We're more than flesh, skin. Inside of us today, as we're alive, is our spirit. And God has planned for us to be here to do something, to serve him first, of course, and to do something that can make a difference, really, both now and for eternity. Think about how many thoughts God has for us. Maybe your favorite beach in Florida or Hawaii or Somewhere else, I heard Greece's beaches are, you know, uh, phenomenal. 
whatever beach you want to think about right now or have been to, think about how many grains of sand. It's impossible for any human to count. And David said, God thinks about me more than the beaches. The battle we have is, you know, it's really multifaceted. The enemy, the devil, the Bible, you know, says his name is Satan, is he's, he hates us. So he's combating that. And then really, if we're honest, sometimes we get in the way too. And, and, and to reach up to God is a humbling thing. And sometimes we don't want to reach up to God, do we? We just want to say, well, I'm going to figure it out on my own. And people start coming up with weird ideas and teachings and ideologies of where this and that. No, no, no. We have to look up, reach up first, excuse me, reach up and say, God, I choose to go back to the beginning. I choose to go back to my origin, you. You're my creator. I look up. God, I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of desires. I want to do a lot of different things that I really don't know what to do. But Lord, I just want to first ask you, what do you want me to do? What's your plan for my life? Because you fashioned a plan for me when I was in my mother's womb. I want to know what it is. And folks, I'm not talking about being a millionaire and have every, all, having your dreams come true. That's not, that's American stuff. That's not bad, but that's not necessarily what I'm saying from God. God wants to give you and I a purpose that fulfills our soul and that causes us to live beyond what we see. So when I think about, in my closing part of this message, when I think about how to connect this, I wanna just share with you something. How, this message can be very ambiguous. How do you and I move forward with the idea of reach up, look up, the fact that God made us in our mother's womb, we're born, then he fashions our days, thinks about me more than the sand of the sea, how do I connect this with my life? Where do I begin? And I really believe, in my final thoughts with you, I really challenge you and I to think about this way. We connect with this truth with God when you and I choose to be a giving person. Please listen to this quote. Maybe write it down. You make a living by what you earn. You leave a legacy by what you give. Not just about money. I'm talking about what you give. What are, you, what are we giving our family? What are we giving? Because there's a great quote that says, you don't replicate what you know. You replicate who you are in others. So what are we giving? So how does this connect? I want to encourage you. First and foremost, we give ourselves to God. We're, we choose to be a giving person we give ourselves to God. Well, that's basic. You know, wait. If you don't know Jesus today, receive Jesus. If you're a Christ follower, this is an ongoing process of giving ourselves to God that I give myself to him. Here's practical stuff. I give myself to God to forgive my enemies. I give myself to God to love people different than me. I give myself to God to pray for my enemies. I give myself to God to change my attitude. I give myself to God to help me overcome temptation. I give myself to God to help me manage my money. I give myself to God to control my temper. I give myself to God to love my wife. I give myself to God to be a good dad. I give myself to God to be a good sibling. I give myself to God to be a good employee. Do you see what I'm talking about right here? So I give myself to God for him to have precedent in my life. I don't know about you, but I've seen some mean Christians. How many have seen some mean Christians? You can be honest. You can kind of, one sitting next to me right now. But I'm, 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 I'm. I mean, when I was in Bible school, uh, we were uh, preaching on the campus of Ohio State University, and um, this woman slapped me. She was a preacher, a preacher's wife, and they were preaching to the students, and they were condemning people and hating, you know, God hates you, and it was crazy. Just, they were just getting a crowd just to stir people up. And, and uh, his wife was on the peripheral, and I was saying on the peripheral, and she came up to me, and she said, what are you doing here? I said, man, we're on the same team, I think. You serve Jesus, it's the same Jesus. And, uh, and I said, uh, you know, what are you doing? And when I said that, she slapped me. Boosh! Get the hell out of here. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I've been persecuted for righteousness. My crown in heaven shall be big and strong. 
And then this big friend of mine, 6'5", tied in, got in her face. I rebuke you in the name. I was like, come on, just get out of here. Just back, just, just back up. And I was praying for a woman to come up and slap her for me, but that didn't happen. But the point is, hallelujah. How did I digress? I don't know. I have forgiven her. I give myself to God to be free. <laughs> so being a Christian doesn't mean it's automatic. You and I have to give ourselves to God every day just to walk out this thing of faith with God. So how do I connect, here in closing, how do I connect with God in this message? I give myself to him. I reach up, I look up for identity, and then for what does God want me to do, and I do that practically by giving myself to God every day for the big and the small thing. I wanna be like Christ. Secondly, I wanna encourage you. This is just, I'm not making this up, this is scriptural. Give to God's work. When you and I become a Christian, tithes and offerings is not a rich quick scheme. It is not a game, should not be a game, I mean, it should not be a game by anybody or manipulated by the preacher. That's all wrong. Tithes and offerings is both spiritual and practical. It's spiritual because we're honoring God with what's important to us and we're letting God have our heart by giving him our resources. Really what Jesus is after is our heart. He spoke more about money than heaven and hell in his parables because he was talking about something that grips our heart. It's very personal to us. God's not against money. He just wants us to honor him with it. So the spiritual thing is I'm honoring God and, and my heart is softening. It doesn't solve it. We're not buy things from God. That's not what I'm talking about. We're just honoring God with what he said. The practical part is it helps God's work move forward. So, I mean, again, if you're new to city or this is kind of a touchy subject for you, the reason why I'm so confident about it is because I know we do things right. We have accountability. We have a CPA come every quarter. Uh, our annual report is on the website, on the app. Please go there today and check it out. Our, our first, on the first quarter of this year, annual report for Hartford the House is out. You can look at that too. Uh, the second quarter report will come out at the end of June for Hartford the House. I mean, there's nothing to hide. But, but this is, so I'm doing my part, but ultimately this is about us individually being a giving person when it comes to what does God have for my life? Well, first, I give myself to God. Then I, I yield to God what he asks of me in terms of my finance because I'm going deeper in myself when I do that. Um, and God works through that. I don't understand it. I didn't make this up. This is scriptural, Old and New Testament. Then we give to God, we give to God's work, and really we give to others. The blessing of life is when you and I live for something beyond ourselves. Life's boring when it's selfish. Life caves in on itself when we don't live for something outside of ourselves. I'll never forget giving a gift to Zayden about two years ago, three years ago maybe. He wanted a Black Panther action figure when the movie came out or, or shortly after. And we were in this place and his friends were there and, and he gets the gift and he opens it up. And I never forget, we have it on video. He's opened this gift and he sees Black Panther. He goes, ah! He was hype. But honestly, I was more hype than him because I had the joy of giving something to my son that made him so thrilled in that moment. He just was unfiltered. The joy of life is being a giving person. In fact, the scripture says in Proverbs in the message version that the life of a generous or the world of a generous person gets bigger and bigger and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. It's an attitude. How in the world when I reach up for my identity, when I look up for my purpose, the plan of God, when I was in my mom's womb, he was, he was preparing my life and I was born and Man, pretty, you know, had a stuttering problem and, and got molested. All those things, that was the devil trying to take me out. But God had a plan and, and th you know, through praying people, I'm here today, a miracle. I want to encourage you today, God has a miracle for you and your family. So yeah, there's a tax against us, but he wove us in our womb and now we're here. And, and to connect to that, in the core of who we are, receiving Jesus, we need to become giving people. God, I give you me every day, right here. 
spoons down here. Without God, I'm just sitting. I'm going to do it my way. I don't believe in this stuff. The church hurt me. That pastor, it, is, it may be real. I went through this and that. Why does death happen? America, you know, has this issue and that issue. Absolutely. So on. But without God, all those things could be true, but without God, what does that have to do with you and your life right here? When you let God do this and take you in his hand, now this has purpose. This is it. This is what you and I have to decide. This is what God wants us to do. And being a giving person doesn't solve everything. What it does, it gives God the chance to do something because whatever I give to God in any form gives God a chance to do a miracle in my life. So I want to encourage you today, who are you looking to for your purpose? Who are you looking to for your identity? How are you seeing yourself? God wants to move in you. This is why we do groups. We want to encourage you. You think about give to others. Think about going to a group this summer. If this summer doesn't work, think about the fall. Group launch is happening next Sunday. Connect with that. Be a part. Step through the awkwardness. Be a part of relationships. Try out groups. Next month, we have our sermon series, Summer Playlist, where we do secular famous songs, and then we preach off of it. And so I want to encourage you, bring someone to church. This is a great series to bring someone who thinks church is boring and this and that, don't know God. It's going to be phenomenal. And, and today, when you leave, get a handout or an invite card, excuse me, and invite somebody. Live for, give to others. Think about other people and give. This is where we live. This is where we thrive. And when I reach up to God for identity, and then when I look up to him for the purpose of my life, it may not happen all at once. It may not come right away. But when I give myself to God every day, when I give God what he asks of me, and then when I give to others around me, it sets up the stage for God to be clear in my life and show me what's next. Now I want to end with this story. My Memorial Day weekend, um, a hero of my life is my dad and my grandfather, his dad. Um, my grandmother was the last surviving grandparent out of the four, and then when she passed, before she did, she gave me a scrapbook that was hers and my grandfather's, and I thought, I, you know, honestly, um, I was hoping for some money, but you know, it didn't happen, but no, just kidding. Uh, but this was far more than money, and I opened it up, and in there was the corsage that she wore on her wedding day. She just pressed it down, 1942. And then there's a, a, a picture, or not a picture, there's the bus ticket, the bus ticket stub that they took to Cincinnati for their honeymoon in that scrapbook. Then their aunts and uncles and friends wrote little notes that they gave or they put on the gift at the wedding and those are all glued in there so I could see some of my great uncles and aunts, great, great, that wrote them notes on their wedding day in 1942. In there, she has articles of my grandfather playing at Butler, playing in the NBA. And then it kind of just stops. And there's nothing else. Maybe she got busy having kids. She had four kids. And uh, in the very back of that scrapbook, I was looking through it one day, and I found this envelope, and it was in perfect condition, and it stunned me. It was a letter from the War Department. And I opened it up, and the letters were perfect. It was two letters, they were, and they were perfect. 1945, a letter to my grandfather to report to Lafayette for he enlisted after Pearl Harbor, he and his friends. And uh, on one letter, it has all these guys from Indianapolis and just, you know, various towns in Indiana. All of them had to report, and, and they went. And my grandfather uh, was a pilot, and... When it came to his final test, he really couldn't handle the figure eights, and so he would throw up in the plane, and they couldn't have him do that. And so they, had, they gave him another job, and he served out his army time in a different way. But every time he talked about his friends that joined with him, he always wept. And one weekend, we went to Bloomfield, Indiana, and we went to the town square of Bloomfield, and there's a memorial there of war veterans. And he pointed to his best friend's name. And he said, he was, we joined together and he was killed on his very first mission. 
and he would just weep. And I knew there was a chance of, maybe some would say luck, that he probably could have been killed too. And I could sense his friends took his place and gave him a chance to live and protect what they thought of America being free. And we're here today because Jesus died for us and gave up his life so we could have life more abundantly in this life and in the life to come. On that second letter with all the list of those men, I remember one, his name was uh, a Maurice from Indianapolis. Oh, there was like John, all these men. My dad looked them all up. They all were killed serving our country. And so today I honor my grandfather. And I honor his best friend that died about 1946. And I would say to you and I today, it's our turn. Not to necessarily join the army and fight. That's not what I'm saying. It's our turn to give ourselves to something bigger than ourselves. It's our turn to give ourselves to God. It's our turn to live with a bigger view in mind of what God can do in our lives. Have fun. Enjoy family and friends. Laugh, cry. Have the love of your life. Have kids if that works out for you. Live your dream. Fulfill vision and purpose. But ultimately, at the end of it, that you and I would live for something greater than ourselves and that we would make an impact both right now and for eternity because we're not here by accident. We're here because God wants us here and he thinks about you and he has something great for you. If you believe that today, give him a great and clap of praise. I believe it for myself and I believe it for every one of you in this room and online. And so right now, bow your head and bow your heart to heaven. And you would say, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus in my life and or I'm far from God and I need to come back to him. If that's you in this moment right now, you wanna receive Christ and come back to him and or come back to him, raise your hand right now to heaven. I wanna pray for you to receive Jesus today. Good, God bless you today. God bless you, thank you. God bless you today. Give them a hand, thank you. God bless you today. It's good. Come to Jesus. And then you would say, you know, Pastor Dave, I want to reach up for my identity. I want to look up because he has a path for me. And I want God to fulfill his purpose in my life. I want to be a giving person and say, God, have my life. I want God to do what he wants to do. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand all over this room and online. I want to pray for you all over this place and say out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything that's wrong. I turn from that, I say yes to you, I give you all of me, I'm yours forever, and I choose to give you my life. Use me as you would want to, I say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. One more big hand clap of praise for what God's gonna do in your life.